particularly enraged about the relationship between Dodie and Diana. His attitude would make clear that the idea was unacceptable that Diana, the mother of the future king of England, might marry an Egyptian, a Muslim, and the son of someone who had been so openly critical of the royal family. Mohammed al fayed believes that the security forces reacted to this hostility, that they seized their moment and orchestrated the crash in the Alma Tunnel. In the intervening years, he has spent huge sums of money in conducting an intensive investigation. That investigation leaves crucial questions unanswered because the authorities in the UK, France, and even the USA continue to refuse to release vital information, thus forcing Mohammed al fayed to proceed inch by inch through the courts in those countries. In the course of the investigations, many other questions have emerged, some of which strike to the heart of our faith in Britain as a democracy. Immediately after the crash, and before the blood samples were even analysed, a massive campaign of disinformation was orchestrated by the security services, which claimed that Henri Paul, the driver of the car, was three times over the drink-drive limit. I never saw the guy drink anything. Um, I mean, he was French, he'd been off duty. The French drink wine at every meal. Um, but in my opinion, he was... You know, there was nothing in his demeanour that would suggest to me that he was drunk. He was, um, he was exactly the same as he was on the afternoon. Just a nice guy, um, and he was sober. Henri Paul passed a rigorous physical exam to renew his pilot's licence just three days before the crash, and the exam revealed no indication that Paul was a heavy drinker or user of drugs. When French officials finally released a copy of the final autopsy report to the families of the deceased, they immediately engaged independent forensic pathologists to review the written report. Their conclusions are astonishing. Professor Peter Venezes conducted a 12-hour review of Henri Paul's autopsy. His family wanted to know, was there any evidence from the examination indicating Paul was an alcoholic? No, there was no indication of that at all at the autopsy. Henri Paul's blood samples were not refrigerated. This raises the real possibility of contamination. If samples are not stored at, um, uh, at reasonably cold temperatures, then you have the added element of the blood actually slightly decomposing and producing extra alcohol within the blood. And this can, um, uh, can give you problems with the analysis. What the blood analysis found has pathologists shaking their heads. Henri Paul's autopsy revealed inexplicable level of 20.7% carbon monoxide in his blood. How did that much carbon monoxide get into his bloodstream? Had Paul showed any symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning before the crash? The level that was measured in Henry Paul at the time that he died would indicate that, say, some two hours prior to his death, he might have had a level of 30%. But if you've got a level of about 30%, someone would have a decided headache. You would have a real throbbing in the temples. The headache would be unmistakable. There would be certainly a, a lack of coordination. It doesn't strike me, when you look at the pictures of Henry Paul, of a man who is really suffering. It doesn't look as if he's got a headache. He's not massaging his temples to try and reduce the pain in any way. He seems to be someone who is quite relaxed in his environment. In control, he's talking to people, giving orders. The official French report of the accident adopted the explanation put forward by the official French pathologist and toxicologist that the carbon monoxide could have come from the airbag. But is this even possible? The statement put up by the French that the carbon monoxide in Henri Paul's blood could have come from the airbags was blatantly ridiculous. Mercedes-Benz point out that their airbags are designed to save life, not to kill, and that they contain no carbon monoxide. Checks on Dodie's blood has also shown that there was no carbon monoxide present. In any event, Henri Paul died instantly. He could not have drawn breath. Is it possible that somehow the blood sample was not Henri Paul's? 
To this day, the French have refused any independent evaluation of Paul's blood. The smoking gun for this investigation would be evidence that the blood tested was not that of Henri Paul's. There were 15 bodies in the morgue that night, and the level of carbon monoxide supposedly in Paul's blood would be more indicative of someone who had committed suicide by breathing in a car exhaust. The French government, however, will not release any information about any of the other victims so that we can confirm whether or not the blood was actually Paul's. Why did the French authorities and the British security services go to so much trouble to blame the crash on the dead driver, Henri Paul? If the evidence appears to be on shaky ground, could it be that the crash was in fact a deliberate act, a conspiracy to murder Diana? Henri Paul was also a keen pilot. Just two days before the accident, he completed a rigorous medical to renew his flying license. His medical found no signs of alcoholism. For him, flying wasn't just a hobby. His flight logs show he was a regular flyer and he had taken courses for flying at night. And all in all, he had completed 605 hours flying time. He was a good man. No, we never had problem with, with him. And he was very serious in our craft and uh, he, he, he make you, his job very good in, in, uh, in flight. He was a good uh, private pilot. He, he's looking for uh, progressing each time. But flying is not a cheap sport. No, a one hour flight costs 300 uh, pounds about on this aircraft. So Henri Paul would have paid 300 pounds an hour? He paid it. It seems that Henri Paul led an expensive lifestyle. But where did he get his money? The respected journalist Nicholas Owen tried to answer that question in the independent television film the secrets behind the crash. Henri Paul's salary at the Ritz was around £20,000 a year, and from talking to his friends, he sounds like the sort of man who spent his salary every month. But we've discovered that actually he was much better off than he appeared. Whatever anyone says about Henri Paul, one thing is clear, this was a man with some very big secrets indeed. Apart from two accounts in a bank outside Paris, he also had three accounts and a safety deposit box here at the Banque Nationale de Paris in the Place Vendôme, just a few steps from the Ritz. Just a short walk away, he had another three accounts here at Barclays in the Avenue de l'Opera. But that's not all. He also had one current and four...